Good afternoon. My name is Jane Tillman and I'm the Evelyn Stephenson Neff Director of the Erickson Institute here at the Austin Riggs Center. I want to welcome all of you to the third of our four roundtable presentations examining the experience of immigrants and refugees and how this diverse group shaped 20th century North American psychoanalysis. The roundtable series honors the late Anton O. Chris, an immigrant from Vienna, a psychoanalyst at the Boston Psychoanalytic Institute and a supporter of the Sigmund Freud Museum in Vienna. The roundtable discussions are part of a larger project that the Erickson Institute is embarking on in collaboration with the Freud Museum in Vienna. Our collaboration is entitled From Despair to Hope, The Holocaust, Immigration and Psychoanalysis in North America. This summer here in Stockbridge, we'll open an exhibition that has been at the Freud Museum in Vienna and that tells the story of the organized escape of psychoanalysts from Vienna in the 1930s. If you are in Stockbridge this summer, we invite you to visit the exhibit. As part of the exhibit, we're gathering stories of immigration and we would like your contribution to this project. So we invite you to submit your story to us in a link in the chat. And that link will appear several times uh, during the round table today. As we begin, let me note that the Austin Rig Center is in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, a town started as a mission to the Mohicans, who are the indigenous peoples of this land. With sometimes painful self-reflection and humility, we acknowledge that we are learning, speaking, and gathering on their ancestral homelands. After enduring tremendous hardship and being forced from here, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We honor and pay respect to their ancestors, past and present, as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Thank you for joining us today. Now, on to some housekeeping details. We'll have the chat function on during the lecture. And please feel free to use it to comment, to let us know where you're joining from. We have an international audience today, uh, so we'd like to uh, hear where you're joining. You're eligible to receive 1.5 CE or CME for today's presentation. And the chat section has information on how to complete the evaluation and receive credit and the certificate. But you should be aware that it can take up to 24 hours for your attendance to register in our system. And you must have attended the entirety of this webinar to receive credit. Now I want to introduce our collaborator, Dr. Daniela Fenzi from the Sigmund Freud Museum in Vienna. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, and good evening. Uh, hello from Vienna. I'm here sitting at the Sigmund Freud Museum at Berggasse 19, and I would also like to briefly welcome all panelists and all participants. We are very happy and excited about this collaboration, about the different roundtable um, discussions, but also about the exhibition project. Um, just one very short remark. Today um, it's 11 um, of March. Um, uh, tomorrow, 85 years ago, uh, on the 12th of March, um, the German troops arrived in Austria and on March the 13th, the so-called Anschluss, the annexion of Austria to German, um, Germany to Hitler, Germany took place. Um, Freud was writing in his diary, um, Finis Austria Anschluss an Deutschland. Um, on the same day, um, a meeting, a board meeting of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society took place here at Berggasse 19 in Freud's waiting room and two resolutions were passed, which were then communicated to Freud. First of all, all members of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society are to leave the country as soon as possible. And second, the seat of the Viennese Society uh, should be relocated at Freud's future residence. So this happened just 85 years ago, and this was also the beginning point of our exhibition project. I'm very happy that this exhibition will now travel to Stockbridge, and I'm very much looking forward to our discussion tonight. Thank you for your attention and I will 
give the floor back to Jane. Thank you, Daniela, and thank you for that historical reminder. Yeah. I'm now uh, pleased to introduce our moderator for today's roundtable, Dr. Thomas Kohut. Dr. Kohut is currently the Sue and Edgar Wackenheim III Professor of History at Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts. He's a graduate of the Cincinnati Psychoanalytic Institute and is also president of the Freud Foundation US. Dr. Kohut has written three books, Empathy and the Historical Understanding of the Human Past, a German Generation, an Experiential History of the 20th Century, and Wilhelm and the Germans, a Study in Leadership. Tom's a great friend of the Erickson Institute and collaborator, and I will now turn the program over to him. Okay, thanks, Jane. So um, this is the third out of four panels that are um, dedicated to the memory of Tony Chris. And um, it's the it's the last one that's that is going to be talking about probably directly the Holocaust and its impact on um, psychoanalysts and psychoanalysis. Um, uh, the idea for this third panel uh, comes from Diane O'Donoghue, who's going to be our first speaker. And it's an incredibly interesting and provocative uh uh, title and subject, what psychoanalysis lost uh, as a result of the Holocaust. And I think as one of the other things that we will come through loud, loud and clear today, it's not just the Holocaust, but it's also anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic persecution and racial persecution, uh, the role that that played in, in the lives of psychoanalysts and in um, the shape of psychoanalysis. So Diane is our first speaker. Um, she's a historian of visual culture and holds appointments at Tufts and Brown universities. She's been an affiliate scholar and faculty member at the Boston Psychoanalytic Society and Institute, where she is currently chair of the Division for Interdisciplinary Psychoanalysis and directs the Ecker Fellows Program. The author of numerous articles and books, Diane's work has received several prizes, and she, most relevant for today, has connections to both institutions sponsoring these panels. Uh, she was the Freud Fulbright Scholar at the Freud Museum in Vienna, and portions of her book, On Dangerous Ground, Freud's Visual Cultures of the Unconscious, recipient of the 2019 Robert Liebert Award, were written during her time as an Erickson Scholar at Austin Riggs. Thank you, Dan. My thanks uh, to you, um, Tom, to Jane, Allison, and Kathy, all who have helped organize this, and to Daniela and our colleagues at the Freud Museum Vienna. We last saw each other there um, and their role in organizing the upcoming version of the exhibition to be shown at Austin Riggs. And I hope many of you are able to, um, to go and see that. I also want to remember, as others have done in previous panels, Tony Chris, and also his sister, Anna Chris Wolf, both of whose paths crossed mine around various activities at the Boston Psychoanalytic uh, Institute, but also for whom I probably had the strongest connection in more personal conversations around Vienna, both about their memories of the city and then my more recent experiences there. When a much loved object acquired by the Art Museum in Vienna by their father, Ernst, whose life was so richly discussed um, by Lou Rose in the previous panel, was stolen in a heist right out of a Hollywood script and then safely returned after being found buried in a forest outside of Vienna. You can't make this up. Um, we rejoiced. And then when it was uh, returned, there was an outpouring of museum merchandise featuring the object, a very elaborate salt holder from the renowned 16th century goldsmith and sculptor Cellini um, to, re, to commemorate its safe return. This allowed me to be among the few, maybe only colleague to ever gift Tony and Anna with refrigerator magnets. But my thoughts today focus on a different story one that I told them after walking near the Freud Museum and recognizing the name of the street where they had lived as small children. I decided to walk along it 
unsure of which house they lived in, but remembering that Anna had said that visiting there in the early 1970s, the building had remained as she remembered. My uh, thought walking there was one that was frequent for me in Vienna. What would have happened if in this case, the Chris's had remained? What if psychoanalysis, its residence with Freud just down the street had remained? But that gray afternoon also provoked the sobering sequel to that question, one that resonates with the topic and inspired me to talk to Tom about this. What was the price of this loss? In some ways, the response to that might appear self-evident. After all, millions of people, at least some of whom would have been involved in psychoanalysis as clinicians, teachers, but also as patients, and in some cases, all three, were systematically and brutally murdered. Cities like Berlin, Vienna, Budapest had analytic communities in which sizable numbers of their members would go into exile, as you just heard so poignantly recalled um, 85 years ago uh, by Daniela, in other institutes into hiding, and in some locations deported to camps to which most did not return. The reckoning of lost in terms of what can be charted between the late 1930s and 1945 is of course a crucial one for the history of psychoanalysis. But I pursue another relevant inquiry here. My comments will focus on the question of when what culminated in the Holocaust actually began for psychoanalysis. I will suggest that there is what I would call a foreboding that was present in the construction of psychoanalysis from the start. For its first essay that explicated the workings of the unconscious, the psychical mechanisms of forgetfulness, was introduced just days prior to being written and submitted for publication in a letter to his then most intimate interlocutor, Wilhelm Fleiss, in the autumn of 1898. I've written about how anti Semitism shaped the story of the forgetting of an artist's name and that Freud could vividly remember the painting, but chose not to disclose any of the quite pernicious content. The letter begins to fleece by decrying the current environment in Vienna. He says, but which I should say was increasingly hostile due to the intensification of power under the anti-Semitic mayor, Karl Lueger. He begins, quote, it is sheer misery to live here and no atmosphere in which the hope of completing something weighty, and that term could be also translated as difficult or ponderous, um, can survive, end quote. What would he come to feel by staying in Vienna that his project, his ponderous work, would never fully achieve? I think it's noteworthy to recall that Freud fantasized about living elsewhere. He had imagined a home in England where his half brothers had both lived, in a letter to his then fiance, Martha Bernays, uh, at the time of just prior to his marriage. And of course, he would eventually end up living the last year of his life in London. But there is another locale, one that he begins, um, one that he speaks of at the beginning of his writings on the workings of the unconscious and identifying the contours of psychoanalysis. The year after writing the paper on forgetting, his essay on screen memories of 1899 presents a rare, unexpected, thinly veiled autobiographical story of a man born in the provinces, as he was in a market town in Moravia, moving to a large town as he did as a small child to Vienna, about which nothing of his early life in that city was worth remembering. He laments his departure from his birthplace, wondering what life would have been like had he remained there. This amnesia, a repression that Adrian Harris mentioned last time, needs to be understood in terms of his own migration, not the one at the end of his life, but the one that marked his early years, where they were coupled with economic instability, shifts in family dynamics, and ongoing disruption. He lived in perhaps as many as 10 locations before he reached the age of 10. But now at age 40 or over 40, as the 19th century ends, he penned these early writings on the workings of psychical structures 
as he contended with an experience of Vienna that he may again wish to disavow, not to have it be worth remembering, as it nevertheless lurks, as he writes to Fleece, just beyond his window. I am certainly not the first to suggest that the Habsburg capital, as it became increasingly intolerant and reactionary, brought Freud's work along with that of various artists and writers to seek increased interiority. It is my contention that choice is made to shape his vision of the unconscious as a decidedly intrapsychic model had his affective responses to his environment running through it. That window, that window pain, and I use that in both senses of the word, resulted in work that may have lost parts of what it might have been decades before the blatant violence, always there, would claim the lives of four of, of Freud's four elderly sisters and result, as we all know, in his late in life exile. Thus fulfilling the more, more chillingly the line written in his letter to Fleece of 1898. Here, weighty thinking cannot survive, certainly, but the thinker cannot survive. I am not suggesting that Freud ever imagined the coming destruction of Europe's Jewish communities, but rather how psychoanalysis was born in a city where the clouds of extinction were already gathering and had been for some time. For its formulations, I believe, hold much that went unsaid, unexamined, trailing off, as with associations to his dreams, where he declines to speak further. In unraveling some of this in my own work, a great many of these omissions concern the impact of forces most fueled in one way or another by anti-Semitism and all from the outside. As an art historian, I sometimes think of Freud's construction of the unconscious as similar to an Escher print. If you look at it one way, you see a rather undistinguished background. But then on further scrutiny, you see that it in fact allows that which holds our attention to be shaped. And can we also ask the question, what did psychoanalysis lose by emerging more broadly from institutionalized exclusion, from discrimination, the rise of extreme nationalism and racism. What lessons from this might we learn and offer others whose sociocultural accomplishments have also arisen in surroundings of oppression, or as Freud would say, of misery? Thank you. Thanks, Diane. Um, so our next speaker is uh, the Reverend Pamela Cooper White. Um, uh, she is the Christ, Christ, Christiane Brooks Johnson Professor of Psychology and Religion. And uh, Pam recently served as Academic Dean and Vice President at Union Theological Seminary in New York. She's published 10 books, including Old and Dirty Gods, Religion, Antisemitism, and the Origins of Psychoanalysis, Many Voices, Pastoral Psychotherapy, in relational and theological perspective, and most recently, um, the psychology of Christian nationalism, how people are drawn in and how to talk across the divide. She was the 2013-14 Fulbright Freud Scholar of Psychoanalysis at the Vienna Freud Museum, also teaching at the University of Vienna, and is an honorary member of the National Psychological Association for Psychoanalysis and an academic member of the American Psychoanalytic Association. She serves, along with me, uh, on the board of directors of the Freud Foundation US and holds leadership roles in organizations including the Society for Pastoral Theology, the Psychology, Culture, and Religion Program Unit of the American Academy of Religion, and the International Association for Spiritual pa Care. Pam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tom. And welcome to everybody. It's a delight to be a part of this panel and an honor to be asked to be here. So um, I'm going to say a lot of things that will uh, be segue nicely from Diane's talk. We have a lot of overlapping interests. Um, 
First of all, I want to say historians have tended to fall into two camps regarding the influence of Jewishness on the development of psychoanalysis. On one side of the divide, there are those who see being Jewish as a fact of life for Freudians, but otherwise peripheral to their theorizing in contrast to their pan-German intellectual identity. So for example, Freud's well-known biographer, Peter Gay, wrote, the claim for the Jewishness of psychoanalysis based on its materials or its intellectual inheritance have proved to be without foundation. It remains an impassioned, wishful guess, nothing more. On the other side are those who emphasize the influence of Jewish intellectual thought, religious heritage, and the social situation of Freud's ideas. Mortimer Osto, for example, argues that Judaism and psychoanalysis share mutually reinforcing elements, a belief in the power of knowledge, a position of dual marginality, social marginality as Jews and academic marginality as psychoanalysts, and a locus of struggle with internal conflicts at the interface with a new Jewish world, a non-Jewish world, meaning here in America. David Menyahi views psychoanalysis as a product of and an, quote, event within Fantasiecla Judaism, contemporaneous with and influenced by the conflicts in vision between Zionists and the Jewish socialist reformers. Now, by 1902, the year the Wednesday Night Society was founded, Freud's inner circle had become more disillusioned about grand enlightenment ideals. And although they still held to some of the assimilationist hopes of rising from the ghetto into the professional classes, they were also attracted to a twofold fight against the conservative psychiatric mainstream and against the public politicization of an increasingly racialized anti Semitism. The fact that they were an oppressed minority even contributed to a feeling at times of intellectual freedom. They had less to lose in terms of power and prestige in the society at large, but also more to gain from a self-chosen opposition to the what Freud called the compact majority. My time at the Freud Museum led me to understand that the surrounding atmosphere of anti-Semitism, even before the rising horror of the Nazi movement, stands at the fonds at Origo of psychoanalysis. Anti-Semitism shaped the first analyst's ethical sense and was formative in their theory as a desire to analyze from the underside what lay beneath every surface of the human psyche. Obviously, there's no one impotence behind the development of psychoanalysis and to claim anti-Semitism as a singular root cause would be reductionistic. Yet, with its curling tentacles, anti-Semitism is one of the most pervasive as well as often denied social forces in 20th century Vienna and could not have failed to suffuse the thinking of Freud's circle in some ways, both conscious and unconscious. Anti-Semitism constituted an ancient, ancient ocean of hatred in which the first psychoanalysts, almost all of whom were Jewish, had to swim throughout their entire lives. It took constant vigilance to survive, much less succeed in its dangerous waters. The emigre analysts in their efforts to assimilate into the new American context never talked openly about their experience, but anti-Semitism was not just something that had been vaguely floating in the European air around them. Overt violence broke out around the election of the first openly anti-Semitic mayor, Karl Lueger, in 1897, just two years before Freud completed his interpretation of dreams. In their memoirs, both Steckel and the photographer Engelmann recorded violent confrontations with anti-Semitism during their university days. Freud's son, Martin, reported being wounded by a knife in an anti-Semitic brawl. Anti-Semitism then stands as a total context, an eradicable overarching reality that could not have failed to influence these first analysts' discoveries and explorations, and without which their theorizing and also their forays into cultural analysis as applied psychoanalysis cannot be fully understood. Diane has already um, said some things that relate to this. The uncanny was everywhere and nowhere in Fantasiecla Vienna. Young girls dressed in virginal white made their society debuts at 
the vertiginous January waltzes, while Schnitzler's Süße Mädel survived by entertaining the same girl's fathers in backstreet apartments. The repressed in Vienna was an open secret, and beneath the mannered Gemütlichkeit that made everyone appear to be an aristocrat, Jews became the repository of Gentile Austrians' projections of their own envy, greed, and sexual hunger. Vienna was burning from the inside with its fever of its own hysterical contradictions. The assimilationist story that psychoanalysis is simply a Western science is the narrative told most often, even by the emigre analysts themselves. But the subversive knowledge of oppression is the uncanny truth of trauma, which returns again and again in disguised form, but can never remain entirely repressed. The early analysts' efforts to resist anti-Semitism's penetrating logic of denigration could not have failed to inform and shape their ethical sensibilities and a vision of social justice. This experience infused them with a psychic need to analyze what dark secrets lay beneath the human psyche, of which sex and aggression were perhaps the most powerful in the decades around fin de siècle Vienna. Thus, anti-Semitism had an indelible impact on the formation of psychoanalytic theory and practice. An embattled sense of intellectual freedom developed in the second generation of Viennese and German analysts, including Anna Freud in Vienna and Otto Fennichel, Annie Reich, and Edith Jacobson, among others, in Berlin. They viewed psychoanalysis as a means not only for therapeutic treatment of individuals, but as a whole movement for sexual and social reform. For example, their establishment of polyclinics, the kindergarten at the Karl Marx Hof, the Hietzingschule, and Fennichel circulating his underground socialist Rundbrief throughout the entire Nazi period as a way of keeping faith both with Freudian psychoanalytic thought and its connection to social reform. Anna Freud recalled in an interview, back then in Vienna, we were all so excited, full of energy. It was as if a whole new continent was being explored and we were the explorers and we now had a chance to change things. It's precisely this hope, I believe, that was lost in the emigration to America, probably more than to any other continents, as Russell Jacoby describes, post-war psychoanalysis lost both its philosophical and its political features, losses to which a new generation of American trainees were unaware. By the 1950s, Jacoby writes, psychoanalysis became transformed and transformed itself. The psychoanalytic texts endured, but the spirit and culture vaporized. For the refugees, suppression of their culture was a small price to pay. Initially, they buried, adjourned, or abandoned a political psychoanalysis in the name of personal survival. End of quote. The social reformist roots of psychoanalysis were sheared off in the process of emigration to the U.S. The desire to suppress the traumatic memory of the Holocaust, with a renewed project of assimilation into American life, and WASP dominance in the professional classes, combined with a, quote, whitening of psychoanalysis using Melanie Suchet's term, and a reluctance to be identified as socialist Jews or Jewish socialists heightened in the McCarthy era. What was lost after the Holocaust? Certainly one major loss was the attention to social and political context that had characterized earlier 20th century psychoanalytic thought and action. As Emily Kurloff has so brilliantly described and will probably share some more with us in this roundtable, the narrowness of post-war psychoanalysis echoed both the authoritarianism the emigre analysts had escaped and reduced and hardened their theorizing as if sealed in amber. Psychoanalysis was thus slow to recognize the impact of patients' real experiences and the impact of social context was almost entirely ignored until recent decades. Everything was about Oedipal interpretation of individual struggles. In the politically fraught times in which we now live, can we revive a program of social change that was part and parcel of psychoanalysis and its earliest iterations? I'm gonna stop there. 
Thanks so much, Pam. Uh, so um, I'm now going to introduce Daniela Finzi, and it gives me real pleasure to introduce Daniela as a panelist because I have experienced Daniela so often as the introducer of others, but she is a very significant scholar in her own right, and it's nice to have her finally have a chance to show that side of herself instead of presenting, allowing other people to present their own scholarship. Daniela has been a researcher and curator at the Sigmund Freud Museum since 2009. She has been the academic director and a board member of the Sigmund Freud Privatstiftung since 2016. Her research interests are psychoanalytic cultural theory, exile, and gender studies. At the Freud Museum, she has curated several exhibitions, including, particularly relevant for today, Organized Flight, Survival in Exile, Viennese Psychoanalysis, 1930 eight and beyond. She was also decisively involved in the creation of a new permanent exhibition that opened in 2020. Daniela's most recent publications include the anthology, Freud and the Emigre, Austrian Emigres, Exiles and the Legacy of Psychoanalysis in Britain, 1930s to 1970s, co-edited with Alana Shapira, and the catalog of the new permanent exhibition, Freud, The Origin of Psychoanalysis, 9th District Vienna, Berkasa 19, which she co-edited with Monika Pessler, director of the Sigmund Freud Museum in Vienna. Daniela, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Tom, for this kind uh, introduction. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, I'm really very pleased um, to participate at today's third round table, not only as a co-organizer, but also as a panelist. Um, in what now follows, I would like to focus my attention on two areas or two parts um, that have only been touched upon in the special exhibition that we developed in 2021. And looking at each of these two parts from an Austrian perspective. After all, I'm the only Austrian um, researcher here. So firstly, I'm interested in how psychoanalysis changed and what psychoanalysis may have lost in the post decades in the United States. And secondly, with regard not only to the expulsion of psychoanalysis, but to the massive cultural and scientific exodus Austria was suffering, I would like to ask what Austria lost in the Holocaust and what failures Austria can be accused of in the post-war years. So what Austria obviated after the end of the war. Part, part one. <clears throat> when the Viennese psychoanalysts had to leave Vienna after the Anschluss to Hitler Germany in March 1938, they fled, so to say, from the center of psychoanalytic movement in Europe. In the 1920s, Berlin had developed into a new center for psychoanalysis. So for a good decade, Berlin outranked Vienna or the Viennese group. But from 1933, however, with Hitler's rise to power in Germany, Vienna again became the center of psychoanalytic movement in Europe. In 1937, there were 68 members of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society, 50 of them residing in Vienna. Only three of them, August Eichhorn, Richard Nepalek, and Alfred Winterstein, could remain in Vienna as non-Jews without fear of persecution. And as you know, thanks to the help and the assistance of the international psychoanalytic community, all threatened members were able to leave the country, to leave Vienna by spring uh, of 1939, the vast majority settling in the United States. The psychoanalysts who had to leave Vienna left the city that until the establishment of Austrofascism in 1933-1934, was characterized by contradictory developments, by a dialectic of movement and counter-movement. In short, by ambivalence. The so-called Red Vienna, with its highly complex and fascinating, even avant-gardist developments and experience in the fields of science, architecture, urban planning, education, was opposed by a formation of counter-forces, by the so-called Black Vienna, as Jacob Wasserman called it. In exile, the Viennese analysts were exposed to a completely different mentality and culture. 
with, I would say, much less contradictions and ambivalence. They were soon to find out that they had entered a highly competition and achievement-oriented society in which money and material possession constituted important values for regaining social positions. In order to survive and to succeed, the emigres had to adapt themselves to this new culture, another way of life, another mentality, which can be outlined with terms such as pragmatism, practicality, future-oriented optimism, let's fix it. Compared to Viennese or European um, attitudes to life, the, this meant less fixation on the past, less cultural pessimism, less endurance of ambivalence. And this had, of course, had to shape the development of psychoanalysis. No other intervention, however, affected the development of psychoanalysis, like the decision of the American Psycholytic Association in 1938 to admit only physicians as psychoanalysts. As you know, it's only since 1989 that psychologists also have been allowed to acquire psycholytic training within the organizations of the American Psycholytic Association. Depending on one's own perspective or research interest, the view and the balance uh, on or about the transformation process changes. Bernhard Handelbauer, who, along with Elke Mühleitner and Johannes Reichmeier, is one of the most important Austrian historians of science, has brought together the various manifold images associated with this transformation or better, the Americanization of psychoanalysis. Growth, upswing, and salvation are juxtaposed with decline, damage, and flattening. This perception assumes an understanding of psychoanalysis as not only a poorly therapeutic procedure, but as a multidimensional interdisciplinary project. Think of Freud's 1923 statement in his Encyclopedia article, Psychoanalysis and Liberty Theory. I quote, Any estimate of psychoanalysis would be incomplete if it failed to make clear that, alone among the medical disciplines, it has the most extensive relations with the mental science and that is in a position to play and that it is in a position to play a part of the same importance in the studies of religious and cultural history, in the science of mythology and literature, as it is in psychiatry." End of quote. Decisive for these last images like flattening and damage is the assumption that, firstly, the causes of the Unbehagen, the discontent in culture, are no longer explored, in post-war psychoanalysis in the United States, that the social conditions are no longer questioned, that the tragedy of being human is no longer recognized. A significant indicator of this would be that Freud's concept of the death drive has hardly been discussed by US analysts, also libido theory has been neglected. And in addition to the amputation of the cultural critical aspects of psychoanalysis and the loss of the philosophical and theoretical discussion, secondly, the loss of political orientation can also be mourned. This decline of political psychoanalysis, we already heard it by um, Pamela Cooper-White, was described by Russell Jacobi in 1985 as the triumph of conformism. But I think it's important to keep in mind that it were also the European analysts, such as Franz Alexander, Chandorado, and Karen Horney, who were instrumental in shaping American psychoanalysis in the early 1930s. Or think of the Viennese emigrant, Heinz Hartmann, the co-founder of American Ego Psychology. He already wrote his, work, his first work on mechanism of adaption in Vienna. Okay, now I come to, to the second part uh, of my remarks. On the, of the former members and candidates of the Vienna Psycholytic Society, only Walter Hollitscher came back from London, Otto Fleischmann from Budapest, and Robert Hans Jokel from France. 
they returned to Vienna in 1946. Holliger, a communist, resigned from the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society already in 1948, criticizing psychoanalysis as an expression of bourgeois ideology. Jokl, in turn, did not succeed in settling in Vienna. He emigrated, so he re-emigrated, emigrated to the States in 1947. His letters, which are in the archive of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society and in Thomas Eichhorn's private archive, inform us about the difficult living conditions in post-war Austria, in post-war Vienna, that Jokl had to cope with, and also inform us about the bureaucratic obstacles and hurdles that were imposed of him. This is an important point. The fact that so few psychoanalysts found their way back to Vienna is no coincidence here. I will give you a few figures. More than 135,000 Austrians were able to flee political and racist persecution from Austria, but only a small percentage of them returned to Austria permanently or temporarily. In 1987, the historian of science Friedrich Stadler who is a key figure for the, establish, for the establish, establishment of exile studies in Austria, wrote in his standard work, Vertriebene Vernunft, Emigration und Exil österreichischer Wissenschaft, I quote, for remigration, the rate is 19.4, so that only every fifth Austrian returned to his or her homeland, end of quote. How can we explain this low road and what does it mean? In fact, I think the return or not return can be read as a barometer of cultural, political and intellectual, intellectual development in Austria after 1945. An Austria that could and was allowed to consider itself a victim of Hitler. Already at the Moscow Declaration in October 1943, Austria was recognized as the first victim of national socialism. This so-called victim thesis became the basis consensus of the Second Republic of Austria. It helped Austria and the Austrians to, to achieve an exculpation that Austria or the Austrian otherwise would not have achieved so easily. This was also associated with material advantages because Austria was not obliged to pay reparations as Germany was. So let me be clear, post-war Austria is, mar is marked by the following para parameter. A lack of anti-fascist spirits, then an alibi denazification. From 1948 onwards, there was a series of different amnesty, including the Minderbelasteten Amnesty, which applied to about 90% of all registered national socialists. Then, a gallant treatment of collaborators and war criminals. A provincialization within the scientific and cultural field. Then, very important for today's discussion, a continuing structural anti-Semitism present even within the Socialist Party leadership, and then the fear of losing Aryanized property and envy of potential competitors. In view of this social political environment, it is not surprising, but nevertheless so shameful, that official Austria made no effort to bring back the emigrated Austrians. Such invitations may have been issued by groups or individuals, but not by any government. There is only one exception, the Vienna City Council for Culture from the Communist Party, Victor Matica, who actively tried to bring the exiled artists and scientists back to Vienna. This failure to bring them back was experienced by many emigrants as a second, final expulsion. The culture that once had been a home for them has been destroyed. But, would have been, but what would have been the way back to a country where, after the end of the war, 
anti-Semitism remained widespread. As a matter of fact, it was an impossible task that was ex expected by the, uh, of the exiles of the exiles in view of these circumstances. Um, let me read a short quote by the historian Felix Kreisler, um, who found exile in France. I quote, the Austrian exile had an, ex had an exceptional position. While the exiles from most other countries hoped only to be able to return to their country liberated from fascism and to continue to work where they had been interrupted by the onset of fascism, the Austrian exile had its own specific task, namely to think ahead to the future Austria, a future Austria to re reinvent it free from the dross of the monarchist cooperative national socialist past." End of quote. The memory and the memories of the emigrants, whether from art, literature, science, psychoanalysis, could only be unwanted. A massive return of the exiles would probably have meant an upheaval of the intellectual atmosphere, of political thought, of cultural creativity, would perhaps have put an end to the backward-looking ideology. And that was, this much is clear, not desired. I come to the end. Die Psychoanalyse kann nur dort gedeihen, wo Freiheit des Gedankens herrscht. Die neue Freiheit in Österreich wird, so denke ich, neues Leben für die psychoanalytische Arbeit bedeuten. Psychoanalysis can flourish only where there is freedom of thought. The new freedom in Austria will, I think, mean new life for psychoanalytic work. Anna Freud wrote these lines to August Eichhorn on the occasion of the reopening of the WPV, uh, of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society on April 10 in 1946. In view of what has been described above, it can be assumed that this freedom of thought had not yet been achieved, could not yet be achieved. The question what this meant for the development of psychoanalysis in, of psychoanalysis in Austria in the Second Repub Republic, this is now beyond the scope of my remarks. I would only like to refer briefly to the important work of some Viennese psychoanalysts, such as Elisabeth Preinin, Vera Ligeti, and Sami Teicher, whose work also shows how much, quote, the history of psychoanalysis and the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society can be seen as a mirror of the history of Austria before and also after the Second World War. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Daniela. So our final speaker is Emily Kurloff, and in many ways her, her work is kind of the has been in the background of all the panels that we've had so far. And uh, I think probably maybe these panels wouldn't have happened without uh, Emily having done the work that she's done. Uh, Emily is a clinical psychologist, a training and supervising psychoanalyst at the William Allenson White Institute in New York, where she served as the director of clinical education. Emily is a prolific author, frequently writing on topics at the intersection between the culture between culture and politics and psychoanalytic theory and practice and on action and reflection, body and mind. Most notably in today's context, she is the author of Contemporary Psychoanalysis and the Legacy of the Third Reich. Based in part on oral histories, Emily's book considers Jewish and leftist psychoanalysts' experience of anti-Semitism and per political persecution, expulsion, loss, and displacement before, during, and after the Holocaust, and how those traumatic experiences affected their own psychoanalytic outlook and psychoanalysis generally after 1945. Emily, the floor is yours. Oh, I didn't, you didn't hear any of that, right? Um, thank you so much. Thank you. It's a wonderful, it's an honor to be included with this uh, erudite, impressive panel of people. And I'm especially grateful to Tom for his generosity. Um, firstly, regarding my research and book, if you 
if you ever read my book and you just read Tom's interview with me, it would be enough. So generous, so deep thinking, so moving. Um, and uh, it was great to hear the rest of you. Um, you know, my book, I just want to show, uh, I don't want to, not that I would ever promote my book, I'm not like that, but um, I love this picture because the picture, love is maybe the one word, is this um, moment when Anna and Freud um, finally get to safety in England. And you can see, I mean, the picture just, you know, that cliche, the picture um, tells a thousand words. Um, I've never seen Freud looking so beleaguered and old, you know, and Anna is there sort of tending to everything. Um, it's, I mean, most, the picture is kind of ineffable, right? Which pictures are um, in that in that way. Um, and I guess I put it on the cover because my, my focus is really, you know, exactly this, this panel, which is what psychoanalysis became because of fascism and, and uh, expulsion and genocide. All right, so during the 1930s and 40s, the seminal or founding European psychoanalysts had held fast to the profession, their professional identities, despite a profoundly destabilizing reality from Budapest to Paris and the many centers of theoretical and clinical in innovation throughout the continent, the Nazis disrupted the careers of this group, threatened and took their very lives. That a good part of the community endured an exile is in itself remarkable. But in the end, the 20th century belonged as much to Freud as it did to Hitler. So what are we to make of the ways in which psychoanalytic theory and praxis, and thus the course of psychoanalysis, were influenced by the times in which they both flourished and suffered. Um, I think that for time limits, I'm going to try to um, com compact uh, a lot of my thesis and say that um, the what what is most sh striking to me anyway, although it was never talked about or written about um, before, um, is this inattention to the collision between world shattering events and a theory and praxis, i.e. psychoanalysis, which um, which was unchanged, indeed reified to some degree. Um, the silence that regarding um, the profound psychic trauma that every single seminal analyst um, suffered um, could be seen as a response to trauma. I mean, you're all mental health professionals or familiar with um, psychoanalysis, deep, you know. Uh, very intimately connected to psychoanalysis, know about dissociation, in which certain overwhelming experiences are jettisoned as too threatening to equilibrium. And what's left is the playing out of the disavowed or unformulated experience. Um, these notions are a very popular in current psychoanalytic understanding. So we might posit that the predominantly Jewish European analysts of the 1930s, vilified, marginalized, and expelled from their homelands on fear of death, experienced difficulty holding one version of reality alongside the, you know, the more recent version of reality, which was really trauma, alongside the life previously enjoyed. Um, and um, there have been some people who theorized about exile. Um, Salman Akhtar is one very well-known analyst who writes about exile. 
and how the exile, he says, becomes intrapsychic and intrapersonal. It doesn't, it isn't just, you know, concretized. Um, so that the representative of homeland um, is distorted or idealized or disavowed. Um, more pointedly, Heinz Kohut responds to a journalist's question regarding the roots of his interest in narcissism. He refers to his expulsion from Vienna in 1938 and explains, I've led two totally different, perhaps unbridgeable lives. It is this, he elaborates, that made him alert to, quote, the problem of the fragmented self. This and the other statements imply that some degree of dissociation um, or more conscious splitting off was at least one means by which certain analysts managed or perhaps even avoided the unbearable anxiety and conflict in thinking about and acknowledging one reality that threatened another. And indeed, while psychoanalysis began as a trauma theory, you know, the seduction hypothesis, Freud never really rejected it. He added a tripartite model, but, you know, if you are a, are a scholar of Freud or even a casual scholar of Freud, you can see him including both. It was the post-war psychoanalysts, emigres, refugees, who needed to create this um, mechanized, um, elegant, scientificized theory of mind that was completely divorced from reality. Um, and this is what I began to notice. Um, and it's not really because I'm a psych, I'm an um, interpersonal analyst, because really all of psychoanalysts analysis had this sort of positivist scientificized view of pathology and of um, the theory and praxis of psychoanalysis. What really happened didn't really matter. A lot of, you know, what, you know, um, a lot of people saw like Sullivan as an interpersonal ego psychologist, just trying to get people who were diagnosed as very ill to be able to be realistic and less distorted. And I really do think that the trauma of the Holocaust um, was at least partially responsible for this turn in, um, in American psychoanalysis, which is really where psychoanalysis mostly recovered. England was probably the other place. And I, I, I like to think of this in terms of Heidegger, who was a Nazi, ironically, um, calls the clearing um, or Nazi-ish, um, that space in which experience can be made and made meaningful. The clearing is a metaphor, both spatial and temporal. It is found as well as made um, for the nature of what is considered wor worthy of mention and the manner in which events are understood in a culture or a nation or a region changes with place and time. And during the time in which many of the founding European analysts lived, private experience was not considered meaningful or useful in their professional lives and work. Instead, the notion of a, of a rational standard approach to psychoanalysis was sought as the antidote to human misery, i.e. ego psychology. Reason in the form of um, science would free humanity from the ignorance and superstition that left people at the mercy of their passions and frailties. For many of the European analysts, objective standards also represented a more pointed hope, which is also implicit in what I just said that their marginalized Jewish science could be accepted by the mainstream as a valid and reliable system of belief and therapy. Clinicians shifting subjectivities in response to their social surround would not only hamper this attempt to render their theories and by extension themselves universally acceptable. Analysts in Europe 
later in exile in America, would, themselves, would therefore dichotomize the personal and the professional. While they openly expressed the strongest kinds of loyalties and hatreds towards colleagues, we all know about like the controversial discussions, um, such vociferous battles were waged under the guise of intellectual ferment. Any discourse linking ideas um, or practice to experience particular to the analysts were more or less taboo. This attitude is evident in the recorded personal testimony even um, um, that are presented later in the book that I write, wrote. Um, it's, it's striking that today, by contrast, historicity, I always get this word wrong, historicity dominates our thinking about our work and we are prone to contextualize rather than to separate the idea or the technique from the thinker in his or her or their milieu. As the psychoanalytic historian Roezen puts it, each era asks questions of previous times in terms of its own special preoccupation. These inevitable shifts may allow us to triumph when we see um, as many sides of a thing as possible. Um, so how much time do I have? Uh, should I finish? You have a few more minutes, not too much. Uh, okay, okay. Um, let me... Um, Let me just see where I want to go with this. Um, so despite the silence in written and spoken discourse, there are clues suggesting that the European landscape remained in the hearts of minds. The European landscape and its demise remained in the hearts and minds of even the emigre psychoanalysts who found success in exile. And even those who tried to universalize and scientificize the work. Hartman, for instance, Heinz Hartman, while his ego psychology became the psychoanalysis of his adopted nation, vacationed in France and Germany every summer and chose to be buried in Switzerland with his wife by his side. Similarly, while Margaret Meyer Mahler's memoirs uh, rain praise upon the American colleagues who encouraged her to do the research that brought her great acclaim, um, she too insisted that her ashes be returned to the European town in which she was born. She, her memoir chronicles her flight from the Nazis who had invaded the Hungarian municipality in which she had lived, a trip that took her first to England and soon uh, to America. On each leg of her journey to save, she, did, she describes her increasing pain at the distance between herself and her parents. Um, and, um, so then I ask, why did Hartman and Mahler wish to go back to Europe? Um, actor uses the term emotional refueling, touching base. Um, and notes that most did not return. And I think this is important, important, <laughs> but that, that without this opportunity, the emigre past may become frozen in grief. And, and Akhtar's actually written a book about this. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, let me, I'm trying to make a good finish. <clears throat> I, you know, that, you know, you all know the story probably of Fenekel and um, how he was forced to retrain and how he was this middle-aged overweight guy who had a massive heart attack. Um, he kind of, to me, epitomizes the tragedy of what of what people went through. Um, and um, you know, the, the the real the punchline here is that while Freud was quite able to um, develop, you know, a model of mind. He, that was, you know, energic and nature and structural. He was also quite able to consider the rea reality and the impact of what really happened to people. Um, 
but so it wasn't it wasn't that they were being loyal to Floyd. It was that they were erasing their subjectivity, which they couldn't face. And the mechanization of ego psychology um, followed. I like to say it, it reminds when you read the tomes of the ego psychologists, you know, <laughs> it reads like doing a nose job. You know, first you isolate the organ, then you cut here, then you do this, you know, analyze the defenses, then get right, and then get to the um, the underlying conflict. And then you finally end at the sadomasochism and you're done. Um, and I think that most of these people were much more sophisticated than that and much more nuanced, but this is the way they had to present themselves. They felt in America. Um, okay, I'm done. Great, thank you so much. Thank you everyone else. Uh, I think what I would like to do is just to ask the panelists to uh, say anything that has occurred to them in response to what the others have said. Um, any thoughts, any any questions, any comments would be great. I had a thought just listening to Emily just now, and, and I have to say, Tom, it's it's odd to talk about Heinz uh with you sitting. Tell me, uh, tell me about it. I'm, yeah, I'm going to go for it anyway. Um, it it strikes me, Emily, that what you have highlighted about um, fragmentation that you found in Freud, and I completely agree with you that he never threw out the notion that trauma could be harmful. Um, mm -hmm. um, I feel like Heinz Kohut took that ball and really ran with it, and that um, from another theoretical lens, you could say that um, you're, what you're describing is really kind of the, a, a vertical split. It's not so much complete repression as it is disavowal of what is too painful to talk or even think about, and yet it's not unconscious. It's known, but it's it's hidden away over there. And uh, the first question actually that came through in the Q and A was about. Uh, narcissism of America and were people, the emigres becoming influenced by or taking in that narcissism. And I, I would say, I don't think so. I don't think they became narcissistic, but I can see the vertical split if that's a form of response to narcissistic wounding, but I think it was more likely a, a response to trauma. Um, I don't think they became narcissistic I think they became overwhelmed by you know, Christopher Lash was right. And it's only getting worse that we are in a culture of narcissism um, and that they were probably treating patients who didn't look exactly like their European patients had looked in the past. But I think at the bottom of it all, they were simply trying to survive in this new context and, um, and the vertical split helped them to do that. But we do have some inkling that they occasionally talked amongst themselves about some of what was lost, even if they weren't able to really speak it out loud. Can I say, um, I, I think that what was remarkable to me was that they did speak about it, but not, not in their formal presentations or written um, materials so that it wasn't as though it was dissociated. Or, or repressed, it was that they didn't see it as appropriate to their professional um, productions and presentations. And that really, I think, had to do both with cultural norms, you know, that the, the expert and the doctor didn't, you know, burden anybody with their own issues, but also the postmodern turn, you know, where where the whole idea of objectivity was deconstructed and and the inevitability of your history matters um, to your views. I mean, I feel like we've we, the pendulum has swung in the opposite direction where I know way too much about way too many people <laughs> at the expense of the depth of their understanding of of concepts and 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 the clinical work. So it's hard to find that middle ground. 
Um, yeah. I would just like to commend Daniela um, for this work that you're doing. I know that those of us who have spent time in Vienna, which is for it's all, everyone here <laughs> today, um, has confronted this. Um, and also the, the silences and the questions that surround so many of the issues that you, you know, really so evocatively and, uh, you know, to some degree bravely, I don't think I'm overstating that, are talking about. These are not widely discussed issues, even in common discourse today. So mm. this is really a, a wonderful contribution and wonderful work that you're doing. Um, I remember when I was uh, at the Freud Museum that the late Lydia Marinelli had written on Freud's neighbors and had done that rather remarkable book, which unfortunately never got translated, I think, into English, but it really revealed the fate of that building and that apartment um, immediately after the Anschluss. And I thought that that was a wonderful contribution, but I feel like you are expanding that even more more fully. So just for everyone listening who may not quite understand how um, powerful it is that you are contributing to this and how much silence there still remains. So thank you very much. Thank you. I just thank, thank you, Diane, and thank you also for mentioning this very um, important um, catalog uh, on uh, by Lydia Marinelli's exhibition on Freud's Lost Neighbors. I I have to admit myself um, that I, I really didn't realize in which to which to which extent Austria had um, refused to bring back um, the emigrants, um, and in which way this was. Of course, it was. If you see the the, the social cultural context in these post war years. Um, it's 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 logic and this this what I said that they were fearing the the memories of the of the emigrants and exiles that's that's for sure but I I was really shocked when I read it again because it's still it's not so much written about in the books of history or in the museums of Austrian history these first years after the wars mm -hmm. and what it, it was difficult times and then the cold war um, begins and but uh that only this one politician from Vienna um uh who was also um, here at the reopening of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society in 1946, Victor Mateka, that he was the only voice of an official Vienna who would write hundreds and hundreds of letters to the, to the Austrian colleagues in the United States, bring them back or trying to bring them back. This is really, this is really a shame. Can I, can I just quickly, yeah. quickly say that I went with my colleague, we were both in grad school to, uh, it was like 1985, 1986, to Freud's house in Vienna. It was the re biggest reason we went to Vienna. And first of all, we couldn't find it because <laughs> there was no signage. This is 1985. Once we got there, there was no signage. We walked in, there was no nothing on the door to protect anyone. We go up and there's this one lady sitting in a totally open, empty room and says, oh, welcome, you must be English or American, which is why she was automatically speaking English. Um, it was really, it was, it was horrible. And I kept saying to my friend, you see, they're still so anti-Semitic. And he said, oh, you're so paranoid. And I said, right, I'm paranoid, right. Maybe you can speak to that a little, Tom. But I'm like, can you imagine the house? It was, you, you know, we were there for hours looking around obsessively. Nobody came. It was summer, yes. the time of tourism. It was a nice day. This is, you said it was in the mid 80s. Yes. Yeah. So this, this must have been the last years before this radically changed. There was, 
Um, on the one hand, there was this new interest uh, for Vienna and also Freudian psychoanalysis, um, Vienna, turn of the century. Vienna invented itself as a city uh, in these years with the big exhibitions. And also in Austria started the so-called Waldheim affair and the, oh, the, the victim yeah. thesis and official lie um, was about to break. But it is interesting to see in this context that um, the... Um, the initiative for opening a Sigmund Freud Museum in Vienna was an idea from abroad. Um, the Austrian Chancellor Klaus came back in 1968 from a trip to the United States saying um, that the Americans claimed that Austria should do more for Freud's heritage. And before the opening of the museum in 1971, there was a plague of um, the Mental Health Association on Berggasse 19 outside, mm. um, brought, mm. um, applicated in 53. Um, and so also this was an initiative from um, a professor, uh, a psychiatrist professor from the Netherlands, who was the, the director of the Mental Health um, Association at this time. So this was the first um, public recognition of Freud in post-war Vienna. But as I told you, there, there were the, the psychoanalyst could flee the city. There were very, very few um, candidates and analysts uh, in this very difficult situation in 46 as nobody came back or very few came back. Um, so it took it took some generations to <laughs> to open up a new discussion. Yeah. I had almost the same experience as Emily. I, I was in Vienna for my earlier doctoral work in 1982 had the exact same shocking experience of, and, and later thought I was remembering the couch being there. But then of course, when I went to London, it, it was there. Um, but it was an almost surreal experience, these empty rooms and you want to you mentally fill them up is, is what I remember about that. But I also found it very hard to find the work of other um, Jewish artist, uh, Schoenberg. Yeah. Sheila. Lives were in Los Angeles at that time. That was actually my topic at the time. Um, it was, you couldn't get to see Klimt as easily as you can now. The Leopold Museum, I think, was yeah. found in 2001. So it's been a long haul trying to get recognition of all of these really important Jewish cultural figures in their native city. I, mean, I know, Jane, you have a, you're going to probably want to ask some, some of the questions that I, the only thing is, as a historian, I just have a, want to say something, which is that sort of to fold in um, what we're doing today and what these panels are doing and what the museum is doing and what the Erickson Institute is doing, that in many ways, I think um, they're, I don't know if repairing is the right word, but they're kind of re reanimating what has been lost. Um, over the course of the latter half of the 20th century, which is an appreciation of the importance of the environment, of the historical, the cultural, the political, and the social world, its impact on human beings, uh, to recognize the, the, the power that the, the environment has over people and to, in a sense, re or maybe animate psychoanalysis and, and even clinical work um help 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 raise the consciousness of the fact that the environment plays an enormously important role in people's lives and i think both the museum and the erickson institute who are sponsoring these, these panels and these panels themselves make that powerfully clear i think an added element in the united states anyway has also been civil rights movement and anti-racism work and many other therapeutic modalities took up the challenge of working with the environment and the trauma of the environment much sooner than psychoanalysis. But it's interesting to me that a lot of the work that's been doing in the last couple of decades has happened in the relational and the intersubjectivity school and the interpersonal school. But that Coming out of the interpersonal school, especially, but maybe also somewhat Ferenczi, there was an appreciation that followed all the way through. Maybe it had to go underground for a while, but it was an appreciation that um, political 
and the economic realities affect people and, the, and get internalized in the psyche as something as important as our familial inter, inner objects. I wanna uh, just, uh, it's our practice usually not to read the names of people from the Q&A because the, um, this is recorded, but this, I'm gonna read the name of the comment from this person because the context is important. This is a comment from Michael Windholz, whose father was an immigrant analyst. And he wants to contribute to the discussion saying, I don't think Freud was comfortable with the political. He was troubled by fenical socialism. Jewish analysts, like many exiles, felt they had to assimilate to survive. And I agree, adopt the dominant culture of American materialism. Some emigre analysts could not return, like my father, because they did not want to live behind the Iron Curtain. Ego psychology, no doubt, had its mechanistic and authoritarian aspects, but that is not all it was. Many important theories emerged from ego psychology, for example, Mahler and Jacobson. So I wanted to uh, get Michael's uh, point of view in there and then return to this uh, question that came up earlier. Uh, this is a question uh, that I think each of you can take up. A uh, person says, I wonder, did the analysts in exile in America absorb the narcissistic self-absorption of the American psyche turning away from the socialist hopes that Anna Freud found excitingly possible. I know you've said a little about that, but uh, I, I think we're seeing in psychoanalysis a bit of a return uh, to some sort of interest in, uh, if not socialist concerns, some kind of social justice uh, or, or concern for society and culture in a way that has, has uh, been off the, the table for quite some time in psychoanalysis until more recently, uh, at least in mainstream American psychoanalysis. So any response to, to Michael's ideas or this question about um, the identification with American materialism uh, led to a, a, a neglect of uh, socialist hopes. I'll just throw out a, a reference. I think the beginning of the movement to look at that kind of context in America, again, may be um, among others, um, Neil Altman's book, The Analyst in the Inner City. Um, that And that was what, what Tom, like the 80s? Mm -hmm. that I think uh, maybe the 90s, no? The 90s. But I, <laughs> I still don't, I don't think these emigres were somehow suddenly narcissistically wounded and acting that out. I, I think, I mean, that might apply to, to later generations of American born analysts, but I honestly think that, um, and, and I'm inspired by Emily's work in this too, that a lot of what might have looked like self-absorption at that point was really a defensive move in order to come out of one authoritarian culture and find themselves in another one and not wanting to be victims of that. Yeah, I mean, I com I completely agree with that. I think that, that you know, people criticize uh, American uh, ego psychology as being so scientificized and, you know, um <clears throat> authoritarian you know or positivist but i think a lot of it was that these traumatized people did not want to talk about where they came from they did not want to expose the humiliation the trauma the loss that that really did affect them how could it not and so they erased it it wasn't that they were so authoritarian. It wasn't that they were so certain. Um, I mean, it may have more morphed into that, but I think originally it was self-protection, um, which and, and that adaptive, mm -hmm. speaking of ego psychology. I think this is what came up in our first round table with a uh, discussion between Tom and Otto Kernberg and the, the silence. Uh, that pervaded in Tom, you spoke so uh, movingly and eloquently about the silence in your own growing up around the Holocaust uh, because of trauma. Uh, and, and trauma can lead one to an inward turn. And then I think there was a split in psychoanalysis between the value of the historical uh, 
context uh, for uh, thinking, uh, theorizing, uh, things of that sort. So we've taken that up in some of our other panels, but it, um, it's an important point that the immigrant analysts were faced with not only assimilating to a new culture, but managing a, a horrific trauma that was ongoing in terms of loss of siblings, uh, parents, relatives, uh, and genocide. Yeah, and also loss of mother, you know, mother tongue, the language that one has spoken, um, cultural norms, um, trying to fit into a society that uh, was very different from the one they had come from, um, dealing for the most part with, with a society that hadn't experienced any of the same traumatic events that, that they had experienced. But to me, what's so sad is that they, and I, you know, this again, I'm, I'm kind of a witness, eyewitness, because I was a small child and was with my parents and all these European emigre analysts, uh, you know, they they didn't, I was there as a small, so they, they weren't talking about the Holocaust. They weren't talking about any of this. They talked about other things. They were very, it was just, I don't think they were able uh, to talk about the impact of, of historical events on their, on themselves. And I think, you know, if you look at the history of psychoanalysis after 1945, I think the role of the environment became increasingly important in post post 1945 psychoanalytic schools. I hate to use that word, but I think it's true. And I think it's only in the last ten years or fifteen years that the that the environment, which is so is seen now as much more important than Freud's hermetically sealed or not very much sealed intrapsychic universe of the topographical model of the mind. Um, that the you know that the that it's only very recently that the environment which shapes the scene is shaping the psyche is includes history and politics and society and I think as I said try to say before these panels um, are kind of contributing and the Freud Museum and the Erickson Institute are co contributing to that to an appreciation of that and of course uh, Eric Erickson was here at Riggs in the 1950s and uh, I think was arguing the importance of culture, uh, society, um, uh, all sorts of uh, tangible influences on development and identity. And it's only recently, I would say, in the past uh, 10 years that uh, mainstream American psychoanalysis is a little more open uh, to that perspective. Uh, there's a bifurcation, I think, in the field uh, that was spoken about. Um, I think, Daniela, you were speaking about that. And Jane, you mentioned uh, the term both you and Tom of genocide. It's the next panel, I think, is really going to be a very powerful, important uh, finale to this four panel series, because um, what happened um, in two psychoanalysis was a kind of genocidal targeting of the foundational generation of this field. Um, there aren't that many other uh, disciplines that have this history um, and I think could really actively participate in other conversations about genocides and the impact of genocides. Um, and I, I think that there are, there are works, there are work with some of my colleagues at, at the Boston Psychoanalytic and others, but that the involvement in issues of human rights more generally, I think uh, is something to which psychoanalysis needs to participate um, within its own historical context as well. Um, that there's something very important there um, in its connections, as well as its connections in just looking, as I suggested at the end of my talk, more broadly as to what, it, what do oppressions, racisms, exclusions, and violence um, contribute to the capacity to create under extremely difficult circumstances, but also the cost and limitations of that. We're gonna uh, wind up in a few minutes. Tom, or do you have any final words you want to say in regard to this panel or the three? No, I mean, I think it's been really, I mean, what's been so nice is there's a kind of, there's been a consistency about the three panels. Um, and you know, there's nothing. You know, it's not. It's 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 had a coherence, 
Um, and I think um, each each individual panelist and each panel has had a uh, a kind of unique voice, um, but that the voices to use, you know, the voices have harmonized beautifully, and we've kind of all been singing the same song. And I, and um, you know, I think there's something, you know, uh, gratifying about the, the. This is not just a sort of academic looking back at. Uh, a history, but it's also a part of a history and a con contributing to the future. And I think it's a kind of a way of of moving forward where, you know, where psychoanalysis is more relevant than ever um, uh, as it engages with the world in which we live. So I want to thank all of our uh, panelists today uh, for joining us and all of our uh, participants today joining us from around the world for our wonderful discussion. As a reminder, the information on how to receive CE and CME has been in the chat uh, and that it can take up to 24 hours for your attendance to register. So uh, keep returning uh, to see if the uh, machinery has connected your name to the event. Uh, and we invite you to share your immigration stories with us via the link in the chat. Uh, and we're looking forward to showcasing them in our exhibition that opens June 3rd here in Stockbridge. We hope you'll join us for the fourth and final webinar in this series on Saturday, April 22nd. That roundtable is Beyond Forced Immigration, Contemporary Immigrant Experience in Psychoanalysis, which will be moderated by Dr. Spiros Orphanos. Thank you all, and we hope to see you in April. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you. Tom. It's really a pleasure. Thank you, Tom. Thank Good you, to Tom. see everyone. Bye. Hope Bye. to see you again soon.